Welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. If you're not familiar with Clinical Athlete, we're a network of healthcare providers, students, and coaches who specialize in the management of athletes. You can find your nearest Clinical Athlete provider at clinicalathlete.com. We also have the Clinical Athlete Forum, where clinicians, students, and coaches network, discuss, and share ideas and resources related to sports med, athlete rehab, and performance. To join the forum or for a potential listing on the Clinical Athlete Directory and for all upcoming seminars, webinars, and events, details can be found on clinicalathlete.com. This podcast can also be found on our website along with YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And nice reviews are always welcomed on your favorite platform. And also we have a place on the Clinical Athlete website where you can actually donate to the podcast um, through an Amazon link. So essentially it's no cost to you. When you go on Amazon and buy your toilet paper, you can go just go through our affiliate link and we get like half a penny or something like that. But any, any donation that we get goes right back into the podcast in regards to paying for bandwidth and, and better equipment and getting the podcast on different platforms. And you can also subscribe to donation, uh, make a donation subscription, like 50 cents a month or something like that, whatever it is, anything helps. Uh, my name is Quinn Hennick. I'm a doctor of physical therapy in Orange County, California at Clinical Athlete Newport. I'm joined by Jared Maynard, who is a Clinical Athlete Continuing Education Director and Coordinator and a physiotherapist himself at King Physiotherapy in Foot Clinic in Ontario, Canada. What's up, Jared? Not much, man. That was a you, you didn't butcher my clinic name this time. No, I nailed it. It's like nailed it. fifth time's the charm. He's studying. <laughs> we are also joined by a very special guest, competitive powerlifter, strength and conditioning coach, certified athletic trainer, and clinical athlete provider, John Flagg. John, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Happy to be here, man. It's an honor, honestly. It, it's great to have you. So John is one of the old G clinical athlete providers. One of the, one of the first people that I hopped on the phone with when we started this thing three years ago, I think before, yeah, back in the day. yeah before we launched, you were one of those, one of those guys that, I, that we were talking to and, and just, you know, telling all about what we were going to do. And he's currently the wellness director at orthopedic and sports physical therapy in White Plains, Maryland. Uh, so John, can you tell our six listeners what's led you to your current interests in the field? It's seven because my mom's going to watch. No, people <laughs> drop, people drop off. Somebody dropped, oh, somebody dropped off. My mom replaced over. somebody. Um, what got me uh, initially interested in AT was actually a really good athletic trainer in my high school when I was a kid. Um, wrestled and played football and was constantly getting banged up. And he kept me straight and kept me playing and especially in wrestling he really kind of kept me competitive and if it wasn't for him um i probably wouldn't have been able to compete as long as i did uh from there i did my undergrad at salisbury university which i think is one of the hardest programs in the country and then took it to penn state which is where my dynamic changed um it got me into a little bit of trouble which we'll kind of go over with athletic training later on. Um, but that's when I got the philosophy that the bigger, faster, and stronger my athletes are, the more likely they are to stay on the field and stay competitive um, for the, a longer period of time. And that took me to the clinic where now um, I've been with OSPT for 10 years, um, now the wellness director. So I run all of our cash-based clinical services, um, which is a blend of, a ton of stuff. We do uh, personal training and coaching. We do work hardening and work conditioning. We also do uh, some auxiliary programming for uh, assisting the the PTs and the PTA staff uh, to get people, especially through that last little bit of rehab, which tends to get a little sticky for people. Uh, On top of that, I coach powerlifting, weightlifting, and strongman at another gym in White Plains, which is 301 Strong. So I keep myself plenty busy. That's awesome, dude. It's kind of the, the clinical athlete provider mantra. You you fit that bill very well. Is that three hundred one? Is that facility yours? No, it's one of my best friends. Jo- I can't say best friend. He's going to hate me for saying even calling him a friend. Uh, um, uh, Josh Williams owns that. He's cool. a really good friend. Of mine. It looks like a great facility. Uh, it's grown, man. It's grown. Yeah. It started off in a small uh, kind of industrial park with two squat racks and a small platform. And now it's what it is with a full powerlifting program, strength, uh, strongman program. I mean, they got logs and, 
and axles and the whole works and a very small group of weightlifters <laughs> because it's the, the niche of the niche really. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so the, right. The, the four, uh, well, actually, before I get started, John, is that your phone buzzing in the background? No. Jared? I don't know. I don't you don't so. hear that vibrating? Bah, bah. Oh, I heard it, but I don't think it's mine. Oh. Is it yours? It's not mine. My shit's on airplane mode. Don't try to, don't try to deflect that on me. I'm just, I'm just making sure we're thorough here, All right. dude. All right. It's going to call out the boss. He's calling out the boss, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that because we've got rapport. Oh, that's what it is. Rep it. Report. So, <laughs> wait, did we solve a mystery? John, was it yours? I don't want to lose our six. No. We're going to go down to three listeners real quick. <laughs> the buzzing? Yeah, you I'll take the hit. You didn't hear we'll it? say it's mine. I didn't hear it at all. Oh, that means it's you. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The f well, I haven't heard it since I brought it up. So, there you go. It's like the hiccups. I threw so, it across the room. So, we're good. <laughs> so, the, f the format of this show is another Q&A style, which we seem to be getting some some pretty good feedback on it. People are seeming to like that. Um, we have a bunch of questions from the clinical athlete community and we're going to answer as many as we can. Oh, always a quick, quick disclaimer. Some of the questions we receive are regarding specific injuries and a few of which are impossible or unsafe to answer via podcast. So we'd highly recommend you head over to clinicalathlete.com and find a provider in your area or email info at clinicalathlete.com and we'll try to point you in the right direction for other injury questions that are a little more general. We'll do our best to answer, but we'd still recommend you, uh, find somebody on the directory or, or shoot us an email. So, and then lastly, we always get way more questions than we can answer during any one show. So if we didn't get your question, there's a decent chance we'll get to it on a future Q and A episode. John, as our special guest, do you want to start us off? I will. Um, I do want to knock out a, a quick one for Eric Lagoy, who asked about <laughs> beard oil. Um, I don't use any, but apparently it's really, really nice. So give it a shot, man. Give, give it, give it your all. Um, so the first one I'm going to go with is from Eric at the mindful physio. Uh, he asks how he thinks athletic training can grow and improve and thoughts on it becoming a master's entry level program. Um, I think to discuss this, the first thing I have to do is identify what I would consider the problems with the field. Plenty of times on Clinical Athlete, we talk about general problems with the rehab field, um, disparity in education, disparity in techniques. Uh, all of those things kind of span all of health and fitness. But I really think athletic training in and of itself has a couple individual problems that are unique to athletic training. The first one, which you'll see in a lot of research, especially from back in the early 2000s from the NATA, is a really high burnout rate. Um, athletic trainers work a ton of hours with not a whole lot of reward. So you see a lot of people around the ages of 28 to 32 leave the field. Um, some of that is family work conflict. Some of it is going to a different career from my graduating class. I think half of us now are still ATs. The other half have gone on to be PAs. They've dropped out and become personal trainers, but they've let their certification lapse and they're no longer in the field. Um, the other thing, I think they really lack any level of autonomy. Um, you've seen PT really kind of take the lead on this and with direct access and a few other things. And now the doctorate level program, they have left athletic training behind by leaps and bounds because we still require a physician's signature to practice and a physician's supervision to practice which makes it so that our field in and of itself and our professionals are not autonomous. We require another person to actually practice. Um, that can make things really sticky, especially in some of the settings that we work in, which is the last problem for the longest time. And I don't view it as this anymore, but for the longest time, athletic training and physical therapists have always been butting heads and number one competitors with one another. And one of the biggest problems, if you look at the statistics is we are employed by our competition. Athletic trainers are 40% employed by clinics and about another 20% employed by secondary schools. Sometimes that's as a teacher. So you're working two full-time jobs basically, or you're being contracted by a clinic led by physical therapists out into secondary schools. So those are the, the problems that I identify. The solution, nobody, the, the solution that 
I find viable, a lot of people really don't like. Um, first off, we've spent 20 years trying to get everybody to understand what an athletic trainer is and doing this whole campaign is to like get our name right. The problem that I find with that is that we don't have, a, we haven't created enough value as professionals to even push that message forward enough. Everybody, there's too many times that your first experience with an athletic trainer in high school is they just stretched and iced me and I had to go somewhere else. Um, we don't get results. So people aren't going to remember what your name is if you're not doing the job that you're being asked to do. Um, I think there needs to be more master's level programs, more doctorate level programs, but ultimately, and this is the really unpopular part. I really feel like the APTA and the NATA should actually join, join forces and athletic training should be a specialty track in PT school because it solves the autonomy problem. And I know people are just going to send me so much hate mail for that, but it solves so many problems that we have as athletic trainers when it comes to solving the autonomy problem. There's a lot of PTs that are getting into emergency sports medicine and volunteering at schools and taking those jobs anyway. Um, and it also would probably help with, with some of the burnout and some of the hours and some of the lack of reward in the amount of time that you actually spend. So that's my take. Uh, what do you guys think? Quinn, you go. John, so while you were talking about, especially about the uh, competition or butting heads between professions, it kind of got me thinking about when I was in physical therapy school, Indiana, uh, in Indiana, that was one of the last states to get any type of direct access. And they didn't actually have it when I was in physical therapy school. And the chiropractor chiropractors would actually be in the state hall legislating against us getting direct access. Yeah. And, and that's no knock on them. It's just, it's just one of those turf war things, you know, yeah. and physicians do the same thing to, to or like our medical doctors do the same thing to chiropractors. And then they were doing, you know, kind of lobbying against us getting direct access and then continuing down the line. I get letters. I get emails from the California physical therapy association asking our member, their members, physical therapists to vote against, um, petition against, et cetera, different legislative bills that are trying to be passed to give athletic trainers more autonomy in our state. So mm -hmm. it's like, we're doing the same thing. It's just like, so, you know, somebody stomping on their head is stomping on their head and just kind of like down the chain. Um, is the certification process the, the that is a national entity is yes. the certification process any different from state to state or is everybody anybody who refers them to themselves as a certified athletic trainer abide by the same criteria so you have to pass the boc exam now a few years ago boc and nata separated so now the boc the board of certification is actually a separate entity from the nata any state in the country, you have to pass that test to go and try to get registered or licensed or anything like that. I believe California is the only one that still does not have licensure. That's the okay. And that's what I was getting at. And I wasn't sure about that. Um, and there's one further Texas, where most everybody actually gets paid the most, has their own certification and licensure exam. And it's apparently really hard. Really, really hard. Yeah. But they've taken even more steps. Um, but from there, it, it really depends. It's state to state, pretty much like any other type of regulation. But what are your thoughts on California not having the athletic trainers not being licensed? Because I, I actually was hesitant to eat to I thought it was a negative thing as I'm getting these emails. I was like, oh, you know, vote against athletic trainers getting autonomy. But then I, I knew that as part of it, too. So I was like, well, maybe there's maybe there's merit to that. It does that. What does the license? Is that? give some type of, of, you know, status, or, or do you feel like a practitioner would be safer in another state because they have a, a license versus a state in which they don't? Does that matter? Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. Uh, no. I know, at least for the state of Maryland, it offers you a few protections. One of the biggest ones being that nobody else can claim to be an athletic trainer. Um, 
But unfortunately, that's just not a topic that I have a whole lot of knowledge on because I just don't I don't see a lot of the the negative end of how the licensure protects you or, or that sort of thing. So that's probably for somebody else to answer. Well, I think that may be part of the problem, too, is this is like different and you know, and with physical therapy, different states, every state is different as, as far as the practice act and, and these types of things. And then you've got more of a national entity with the BOC. And, but then you've got these, these states that are different kind of on the fringe. It's just like, nothing mm-hmm. is, nothing is uniform. There's just so much, so much heterogeneity w- with both professions, really. Um, yeah. Especially when you start thinking about the curriculums and, and, you know, what we're coming out with knowledge wise. So with, when I first had experience with athletic trainers, it was always in the training room in college or high school, but you work in a, in a different setting than that. And I, I, I think that that is maybe not familiar to a lot of people. I think when people think athletic trainer, they do think tape and ankles, high school training room, you know, the typical, you know, stereotypical type deal. How did you get into the setting that you're in now? Uh, <laughs> so it, it's a, it's a longer story than I'd probably like to tell. Um, but it started in grad school uh, when I had players getting a lot of soft tissue injury. And the first thing, as somebody who lifted weights all the time, the first thing I started to look at is what are you doing outside of playing baseball? Because that was the first place I was. So we started looking at their training programs. We started to try to modify those things. And as a grad assistant athletic trainer, that's kind of frowned upon when you have a strength staff that's kind of well embedded. So I took that on. And because of that, uh, one of the supervising a- ATs at, at Penn State took a, took that as a bit of a, a plus. Um, Andra Thomas, she was she's still one of my mentors. And she took me on for soccer my second year. And I basically just started implementing that. So I would go in in the morning and I would do all treatments. And then for about two hours, it'd be me and a select group of the guys who were frequently injured. We'll probably say that with a lot of soft tissue stuff. And we would train and we would train hard. Um, And we started seeing those injuries decrease. And as time went on uh, and I graduated, I wanted to find a place where I could actually spend that time treating as opposed to trying to prevent right with with like the taping and the stretching and all that kind of stuff i wanted a place where i had a little bit more freedom um so i i I jumped onto a a clinic staff and was actually working at a high school first until i started to establish some value in the actual clinic and that's when we started to come up with the program that i currently have so i had designed that myself from the ground up so you know one reason i asked that question is because it's possible to work it's possible to do what you're doing, you know, as a, as an athletic yeah. trainer, you don't, you can, you have options. I've also last question here from, from my end, because I'm just, I'm actually curious about, you know, this is I've known a couple athletic trainers in, in different States that it was my understanding that they actually ran pseudo autonomously and they just had a physician sign off on a lot of their documentation, but wasn't actually necessarily in house all the time. Am I, is that a thing that happens? Am I making that up? No, you're not making that up. Okay. All you need is a, all you need is a physician signature, right? Right. But they're your supervising physician so that they take responsibility as well. So if something were to happen, then, you know, that's, they don't have to be in house like a PT and a PTA who have to be pretty much at the same time in the same building with the same patients. Um, because of the travel that's involved with athletic training, a lot of the times you're not going to have a physician there all the time with you. So they sign off on what you're capable of doing and that eval and treat protocol that we get that they sign off on it actually has boxes that they can fill out and say, you're able to do this and this and this and this and this so that you're covered. But if shit hits the fan, they are partly responsible for that kind of thing. So 
they they take some risk on by doing it as well. If you if that answers your question. Yeah. Got you. Jared, you got anything on this? I was, I was glad that you uh, took the lead with the questions because I don't have a lot of experience with uh, work or with working with athletic trainers up here. And I also think that the some of the, the nuances of legislation are, are different. Um, I know there are differences from province to province, uh, but probably my guess, and I can't say this for sure, but my guess would be that they're probably less pronounced than some of the differences from state to state. So hearing that conversation between you and, and John was really interesting. John, let's say you're right. Let's say you do get some uh, some serious flack or hate mail, but say that there's some people who agree with you. What would you advise them on in terms of steps to take to try to catalyze what you think is is the way forward here? Uh, I think the first thing you have to do is go to the NATA with it and you have to show them. I mean, I think, I think they've done quite a bit of research to, to show some of the things that I've stated, especially the high rate of burnout and attrition in the actual field. Um, the lack of autonomy is something they've tried to fight for, for a long time. So I think it makes sense. The problem is, is the competition. We had a hit the hill day, back in college and it was, you know, you're, you're walking down the hall to the same representatives and you got a guy with a PT badge on Mm -hmm. trying to, trying to say this, the exact opposite of what you're, you're about to say. Right. Um, so you'd have to get over some deeply inherent biases to get Mm -hmm. those people to team up together. But I would say go to the NATA first or go to your state board first and, and start at least start the conversation. Sweet. Do you want to jump right into the uh, the other AT question that we had going on there? Yeah. Um, the other one is how do you apply load management concept in the athletic training set, uh, setting? So because of the lack of autonomy in some cases, I'm going to use the, the college setting as a, a good example of this. You're a, a cog in the wheel for the athlete, right? So you have the coaching staff, you have the athletic training staff, and you have the strength staff in most universities. Um, in some places you'll see those things kind of blend together. Sometimes, you know, strength staff and AT staff will, will be together. I know they do that in the U S military now. Um, but a lot of the times, if you want to take a concept like that and build it, then you have to take a authority role when it comes to the education of the supporting staff and the the other staff around you. So we have to start talking to the coaching staff about especially some of the things in field sports like acute and chronic training load, how to manage that sort of thing. We have to start educating the strength staff in legit methods of recovery and actually talking to your athletes about the, the number one question. And Brett Contreras was on Barbell Shrugged and mentioned this uh, a couple, couple days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to ask the question up front, what have you been doing in training lately and have your athletes have an understanding that when they come to see you, we talk about load management. That's going to be probably my first question. Mm-hmm. What have you been doing that has put us in a position where you actually have to come see me? Um, so it starts really with the education. And then from there, then it's, it's managing it by cooperating with the other members of the staff which can be difficult. And that's where some of the difficulties from the previous question come into play because strength staff has their little thing that they like to do. And the coaches have their little thing that they like to do. And the athletic training staff has their own little role. And instead it should be a team effort where everybody blends those things together to create the, the approach that the athlete actually needs. So what do you guys think? Yeah, the question kind of lends itself to to think that load management is somehow a different concept in an athletic training setting than it is in a physical therapy setting or a strength conditioning setting, but it's it's a universal concept, load management. And I think you hit on the the key factor there is communication between staff and different professions. So, an athletic trainer can't impart the load management concept if the sport coach and or the strength and conditioning coach aren't listening or don't want to hear it or Hmm. you you know what i mean so i'm sure that um john you have obviously more experience with this than us but i'm sure that there are 
settings, at high school settings, maybe in particular, where the sport coaches aren't going to listen to an athletic trainer who's telling them that they need to reduce their practice time for a particular athlete or this athlete needs to go 50% intensity or, you know, a lot of the times in the high school, the football coach is also the weight room coach and they're not mm-hmm. a strength and conditioning coach. They're like a history teacher. And in the weight room, it's go, 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 you know, and rah, rah, rah. And they don't necessarily understand uh, chronic workloads or acute spikes in workload as being a risk factor for injury. And so again, the, what the athletic trainer can have all the concepts in the world. If it falls on deaf ears, it's, it's really hard to manage that thing. So, and I don't have a solution to that, but I think communication is, is absolutely key within those endeavors. Well, and it's one of my favorite quotes from Jim Wendler. He said it during an underground strength session, um, talking about coaching high school football. And he asked the guy in the front row, if me and you had a bench press competition this Friday, would you bench every day from here to then? And the guy looked at him and laughed and was like, God, no, that, that's terrible. And he points at him and says, then why do you beat the shit out of your kids every single day in football? And like half the crowd gasped. It was like a huge aha moment for a lot of them. Um, and, and that's, it's, it's a kind of a punch in the face education, but mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, we have to manage those things and we have to make sure, especially with our younger athletes that we, we really make sure that's, that's managed well. Absolutely. I don't really have anything else new to add to that. I mean, you guys just articulated the thoughts that are going through my head really well. Well, I do kind of have a, a a question to pose to you guys from that. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's, it's framed as like in the athletic training setting, where I treat your grandma like I would uh, an athlete, mm-hmm. right? When it comes, because this is a concept. Sure. Where, where, where does it stem away? Because so many people assume that because you're working with an athlete, it's somehow different or inherently more of a challenge than working with the general population. What's your guys' take on that? Is because I, I see them as the same thing as opposed to them deviating away. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be inclined to agree with you. I don't think it has to differ all that much. It, it's, uh, there's a quote that I came across the other day. I can't remember where it was from, but it's, I think it was probably a CrossFit related thing that the interventions probably differ in, um, quality or magnitude, but not kind, you know, this, this comes down to, you know, we're, we're still, we're applying the basic principles of strength and conditioning, you know, and an understanding of pain and things like that um to the person in front of us and if the person in front of us happens to be a collegiate athlete then we're probably doing slightly different things or we're still we're still we're still operating on the same principles but it just takes a different form than if we're operating on grandma ethel who you know just wants to make sure that she can get around fine um this sounds like a similar question to um or similar heart of a question that i get posed a lot which is when patients ask me what I think about chiropractors and I say, I don't know, it depends on the chiro the same way that there are, there's phenomenal chiros who treat the same way that I do and that we differ in terms of title. Um, and there are also crappy chiros then where there, there are awful physios. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not, I, I don't think it has to be all that different. In fact, I'd advocate for it not being, and that's, that's seems to be a general consensus, especially among people who, um, you know, take part in, in these sorts of, sorts of discussions that are part of organizations like Clinical Athlete. But I'm not sure. Yeah, there needs to be much difference. Yeah, I agree with you guys. Load management is a general term. It's a, it's a generic term. So load is whatever is specific to the, the person, their specific goal activity. And that could be synonymous. Load could be synonymous with stress. So we could just call it stress management. I mean, that's what that's what training is. Yep. Is you're, you're managing stressors. You're, you're progressing in a certain direction. Um, for somebody who's doesn't care about progressing their physical attributes, load management, you know, could be managing the, their under, their under stressed tissues or, or they're doing, you know, one thing very repetitively and they become sensitized to it. So you're, Load management is managing that stressor. 
and then maybe adding other stressors that could potentially supplement and make them a bit more uh, resilient, you know, to the thing at hand. But yeah, I think load management is a, is a universal concept. That's just, it's just stress management. Um, and it, it differs, like you said, Jared, in magnitude, it can differ in kind, specific kind, just based on the goal, but sure. the principle, yeah, the principle is the same. I think athletic training does kind of just lend itself to that niche as all as just only athletes. But my, my thing is always an athlete is whoever is coming in my door with, with goals of something physical, because whether they're any good at the thing or they even care about being good at it is kind of like a different conversation, right? But if they, if they have any other goal other than laying in bed or reading a book, you know, they, there can be considered a, an athlete. So that's another thing with, with the athletic training field is maybe the name itself almost limits you because it gives you that public perception that you only work with a very specific niche population when, you know, like something like load management as a concept should be a universal thing through for all healthcare providers, because again, it's just stress management. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just on that point, actually up, up here, I don't think, well, um, actually, okay. So I'm glad that you did the intro Quinn, not because you always do it, but because you said athletic trainer and that cued me that there's probably a difference because we have a lot of athletic therapists up here, which I, whom I imagine are probably working or operating for fairly similarly to athletic trainers. But John, I mean, do you think that based on what Quinn just said with, with, you know, perhaps some of the connotations of the title athletic trainer, do you think something like athletic therapist would make much of a difference or is it more of the, the athlete component to that title that might make a difference or yeah. Well, I think, I think it's the perception of the general population. Um, athletic trainer gets mixed up with personal trainer all yeah. the time mm -hmm. uh, because I have a trainer and that's, that's, that's where the, the miscommunication comes across. Mm -hmm. If you were to say athletic therapist, I think it would get the message across quite well, mm -hmm. but I, I, somebody will probably say I'm wrong. Um, but I think therapist is actually protected to be okay. used. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we can in the U S right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I could be wrong there. Um, but yeah, I think if you were to call it that, it'd be way easier to get the message across because there's already a perceived value by the general public in the word therapist. For sure. Right on. My uh, turn? It is your turn, yeah. Okay. I get uh, confused for a personal trainer as well. I'll say physical therapist. I won't say PT. I'll say physical therapist. Oh, personal trainer? Mm -hmm. No, no. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, not like I care, you know, if you watch, if you watch me, quote unquote, treat it, I'm basically a personal trainer. So, you know, it doesn't really matter, but I, it is funny. Just the general <laughs> public that doesn't quite understand, which is our, it's totally our fault, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who's going to educate them other than us. So the next question here, Instagram handle underscore, 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 Toby with an I. Uh, the, the question is injury prevention, no question mark. It's a statement, injury, injury prevention, but we want to touch on it because number one, the, this is probably the last time as I address this question that I'm going to even say the word prevention. I'm going to take the words out of your guys' mouth. I know you're going to say it, but damn you. I know we can, you can, you can repeat it cause it's that important. We can't really prevent anything. Um, there are, there's too many factors in in injury in pain in performance to account for to to truly do that i mean you could have the most gifted athlete who's who's the most prepared as they could possibly be and if you somebody with a helmet runs into their kneecap and they blow their knee out there's just no way to account for that so injury prevention is kind of a farce but what we can do is try to reduce the risk as best we can injury risk reduction so it's a this is a very general question or statement. So the answers are going to be pretty darn general, but you know, let's talk about 
some non-modifiable risk factors. We know one of the main ones is previous injuries. So I always joke around with my athletes is if you really wanted to prevent your injury, you wouldn't have gotten hurt in the first place because we know <laughs> it's a, <laughs> a pretty strong predictor of future injury is past injury. And we don't really know why that is. Maybe it's a, maybe the tissues never fully heal, you know, no matter what, there's always kind of like, like a little bit of micro scarring there or something that just, they are not quite the same. Or maybe there's some type of, and or maybe there's some type of cortical mapping that goes on where you just can't quite use that limb. The connections aren't quite the same as they used to be, or maybe a combination. Uh, maybe it's the fact that nobody really rehabs appropriately. They don't take enough time to truly progress slowly and step by step by step. And most likely it's a combination of all of those factors as we get older. Uh, injury risk seems to climb a little bit. If we spike our training loads in either direction, which is probably the biggest modifiable risk factor, which we've talked about in previous episodes and we'll continue to talk about is managing our training load, but trying to reduce the concentrated spikes in our training, like, Hey, I didn't do anything all summer, but Oh shit, it's preseason. Gotta go. You know, you jump right in the, in the two a days or three a days or whatever. And, and that's where you see those injury rate rates spike. Um, and it goes, it works the other way. When you don't do anything, you become deconditioned. So if you want to, so if you get hurt once, man, that sucks. But if you want to try to reduce the risk of recurrence, don't do nothing. Because if you do nothing, you are becoming more susceptible to recurrence because you're deconditioning. You're becoming less fit, even less fit than you were. So. You know, we've uh, hopefully we've talked and we'll continue to talk about ways to modify your training so that you don't get in mother nature's way, but you also mitigate deconditioning is really, really important. So as far as I'm concerned, I think that training load management is, is probably the best bang for your buck concept in regards to uh, injury risk reduction. Now, if we talk about specific cohorts like quad index, for return to play, you know, with, with ACL, um, quad index being strength symmetry from affected to unaffected sides. You know, it used to be, I think when I was in school, 80% quad index was still kind of an accepted thing. It was like, if you can get the, the surgical limb to 80% quad strength as the other side, yeah, you're pretty good. You know, if you get that in that four or five month mark and the surgeon's like, Hey, you're clear to play. We'll get back out there. And, you know, now it's like, gosh, that is the bare minimum. Um, 85, 90%, you know, somewhere in that realm is, is now looking like where we need to be. And, you know, even then retail rates are, are pretty darn high. I think it's like 27% or something like that. So, you know, you've got, we don't, and then we don't have many other like cohort specific risk factors that we just don't quite have that, that data. And you guys can, can speak on that if you if any if you can think of something that pops into your head but um yeah I, I think for me it's it's really just about looking at their past workload how they responded to it and then tailoring the future program based on that so if somebody gets hurt i look at the program that they were running leading up to that point and i say well obviously you weren't dealing with that very well and so what if we take that exact program but maybe we chop a little bit off the top end as far as intensity, or we spread it out over the course of a few more weeks, you know, or maybe an entire block. So you end up getting to the same spot, but it's just a little bit more graded approach to get there. Um, I'll stop there. What do you guys think about injury prevention? <clears throat> I think if you are going to prevent something, then it seems like you can predict it. And we suck at that too. Um, you look, I used the FMS for years. I really did. And I threw it out a few years ago. Um, once I did a couple thousand tests on people over and over and over and realized that this isn't giving me really any answers. Um, and then you look at the research coming back from it. It's not very compelling. We're just not very good at being able to look at somebody and a small snapshot of how they move in a clinic or in a controlled environment and say, you are or are not going to get hurt. Um, and that's had a bit of a nocebo effect on people for a long time as well, which is a whole nother discussion. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I'll just echo the one thing that I found, and it's not even, it's a risk reduction thing. I'm going to say the exact same thing that Quinn said is that you have to be prepared all the time. Um, That doesn't mean that you have to be going squat every day and, and, you know, go, go to, go to maximum all the time and all that kind of stuff. But you have to have a legitimate planned training program to make sure you're ready all the time. Um, and that way it at least puts you in the best position, um, to, to keep those training spikes low and, and to continue to move and take, take small steps forward. Jared, what do you think? I, no surprise. I agree with both of you. Um, And I think another piece that came up a bit when we, when you and I were talking to Steph Allen is the psychological component. We know that uh, one of the biggest predictors of re-tear rates for ACLs is fear of of re-injury, right? Um, And I'm sure that I'd I'd wager that's probably, uh, would probably be a consistent finding if we looked at other types of injuries as well. So I think for us as clinicians and for people who, or, or just for, for people in general, even if they're dealing with uh, an injury themselves, I think it's important to understand what we're talking about here and now in that we we suck at predicting injury. We can't prevent it fully. We'll never be able to do that. We can reduce the risk primarily by changing or by ma- managing what we can change, those modifiable risk factors. And then that doesn't need to be, I don't think, a really negative thing. I don't, someone needs to th- I don't think someone needs to say like, oh shit, I'm, I'm doomed. I, I have a higher risk of being injured now because I've been injured once, you know, like I, I get that as a, as a knee jerk reaction. Cause I've, I've swung through multiple phases of that myself, but I think what it means is, or what it, what it should mean is that now we've got a better, less skewed picture of what we're working with right now. Um, wishing it was different doesn't mean Jack cause it's not. Uh, you can only change what you can change right now moving forward. So let's plan for an appropriate period of time to do what we need to do. And what do we need to do? Well, that's based on what the research is and what we've just talked about here. So what do you want to get back to? Where are you now? How are we going to know when we're there? Um, or how are we going to know that we're making progress? So whether that's you know something like quad index, whether that's something like range of motion, or whether it's something like uh, controlling dynamic valgus as you're doing some sort of cutting or jumping. Um, being able to map that out and to make peace with the fact that it probably is going to take a lot longer than we'd like. Um, if, if we're the person that's, that's going through that, I think that's probably a universal finding or, or near universal finding where it just drags on and on. And we think that, you know, we should be better sooner than, than we actually are. Uh, I think some of that can be mitigated with this upfront conversation, um, you know, that we're having with our patients or that, you know, uh, someone who's injured could could have with a reputable um, healthcare provider to help them guide through that guide them through that process because if we know that okay I've you know I, I'm in for at least a year or nine ten months and I'm not going back to play the tourney in two months you know maybe that helps us to pump the brakes a little bit and just kind of get comfy in the seat for the longer the longer ride Does that makes sense yeah yeah I think we have to frame those expectations. Um, especially for the length of time, because so many people buy into the BS of three weeks, four weeks, and you're back at it. Um, we have to, we have to have that conversation. And I think, uh, underscore Toby should (laughs) find a professional that can actually have that conversation and be honest. Um, because it's a hard conversation to have with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, We can go into language and a whole bunch of other stuff now, but that's, it's very important setting those expectations. Definitely. I think part of the, well, there's a lot of, like we said, there's a lot of factors that go into injuries and that's why it's so hard to prevent or predict. And there's a lot of reasons for that too. I I think that it's just hard to recreate game scenarios in clinic I think it's, it's, I think it's hard to recreate the, the forces that go through your body in those controlled environments. And I think that athletes are really good, uh, or our bodies in general are really good at stress shielding the affected area. And our eyeballs are not sensitive enough to pick up underlying deficits. And our testing really isn't that sensitive either. 
Like the, the hop testing for ACL is not a great correlate to quad index. So somebody, somebody can, can have, you know, pass their hop testing with flying colors and they could still have a quad index, a major quad index deficit underlying. And if you don't test that, and we also know that a, man, a manual muscle test just ain't going to cut it. So I, I don't think that our testing is sensitive or rigorous enough and consistent enough through the process to pick up these deficits that could actually be risk factors that we could modify. And I think that we rely way too much on our eyeballs to predict whether somebody's fit to return a sport or not. And I, I was trying to look for the paper. It was a PT inquest episode. I listened to it recently, but I skip around. So I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I don't know if it was a recent episode or not, but they basically, they were, they had somebody on who was an ACL researcher and they were looking at post-op ACL, um, you know, reconstruction athletes with post-op ACL reconstruction. And they were watching their squats and they had them on force plates and they couldn't observe. So they were trying to see if you could observe deficits from side to side, but, or like some type of shift or something like that. And what they found was it was very difficult to pick up on the fact that like an athlete was shifting away. They were stress shielding their affected side, but you couldn't see it. Cause typically we can see like, if it's a major hip shift, like, Oh, they're obviously avoiding using that leg. Okay. Let's intervene. But mm -hmm. even if they look dead center, the body is just really, really, really good at being 3d and shielding that body part. And again, if we don't have sensitive enough testing or we're not it, truly, our tests are not challenging the athlete and we're just going by, you know, the eye test, I think that's a part of the problem too. I think we send our athletes out when they're not quite ready. They're not prepared for game situations, you know, and then there's that, there's no intermediate step. It's like if we clear them or if the doc clears them, sport coach is like, all right, you know, get in there. There's just like a disconnect. And that goes, I mean, that's athletic trainers are, are super important in that scenario because they're kind of like there. You know, physical therapists are kind of on the fringes. We're in our clinics. We're kind of blinded, you know, to that. So we send them off and we just assume that sports med is taking care of them and their sport coaches are going to be smart and, you know, all those things. But, um, yeah, I, I just think that's a big part of the, of the issue too is we could do better. Yeah. And I, the eye test is always difficult. I mean, the three of us right now primarily deal with, I don't want to call them simpler sports, but what I would consider sports of training, mm -hmm. um, uh, weightlifting is a completely different monster, but compared to the multiple different angles that you have to create force on say a football field or a soccer field, mm -hmm. powerlifting and weightlifting are a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. How many times have you seen somebody who fails or misses or, you know, pulls a hamstring or something in what would be considered to them a routine squat. I mean, you can't see it. You can't, you don't even know. You just go, well, well I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I think, I think in our sport training load is a whole lot easier to quantify way easier. Um, and it's our sport is predictable. Like you said, if somebody comes in, Hey, what do you got today? What's, what's practice today? Oh, it's a snatch and clean and jerk. Oh, it's a squat bench and deadlift as mm -hmm. a, as a coach or healthcare provider. I know exactly what that is. That's easy. Um, yeah. football field, soccer field, basketball court. I you're going to play basketball. Great. There's a million different scenarios that could happen. You're going to move your body in, in a million different ways, but you know, we'll go back to the ACL. It's like, Oh, they, Hop testing doesn't mean anything while well, they pass their hop testing, but I got them to a 90% quad index, so we're good. But, oh, there's another layer. How about rate of force development? Because you could have somebody's quad index could be at 95%, but if it takes them twice as long to get to peak force, they might as well not have a quad. There, so it's like, there's so many, there's so many different factors that, that I don't think we test well enough for. Um, and also that, we don't have enough data on what is a prospective, you know, threshold to get them to or not. Yeah. Um, so it's just, there's a lot, there's a, just a lot to learn. I think mm -hmm. we're going to get better, a whole, whole lot better at reducing risk. Um, I keep going back to the ACL scenarios because they're, 
more straightforward than most things. You know, we talk about tendinopathy. I mean, hell. It's fun stuff. It's yeah. all retroactive at this point, you know. But at least we know that we're wrong right now. Yeah, we're having the conversation. At least we know there's a lot more to learn. And that that's helps. a mm -hmm. big, big part of the step. I'd agree. What do you think, guys? we got one more or enough gas in the tank for one more? Yeah, the pain one. That's it. So this one's loaded. J Rock 86, John's oh training partner. That's oh it. <laughs> Gave us something big to chew on. So, uh, is pain tolerance something that can be developed? So, we need to define our terms first. So, pain, like what is pain? And that's something that we could talk about for probably ever. Um, people are talking about it forever. We don't even have a, a constant definition, it's continuing to be define and redefine but but maybe you guys tell me if you agree with it operationally right now we can agree on pain as a an experience that's meant to be the body's way of telling us about something that it that it doesn't like or finds threatening can we agree on that yes cool yes. so <laughs> sorry excellent. i was, I was, on, I was on mute i didn't want you to think that i didn't like your definition <laughs> that's fine i wouldn't have cared um, <laughs> <laughs> one day good <laughs> um so then uh, the next step is when do we experience pain and can we ex or do we experience pain in response to you know mechanical or, or noxious stimuli the answer would be yes is that the only time the answer would be no um so <clears throat> when the body the body's very adaptable right let's say that let's use an example of, of something acute so you 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 tear a callus, right? Hurts like a son of a bitch the first time or for the first little bit. And then you probably notice over the next few days that it gets better and better. Um, and we might assume that's probably well correlated with the, um, the healing of that, that exposed tissue underneath. And we might be right. We might be wrong. Um, but <clears throat> there's probably some, some bit of accommodation that's happening where we're getting close to the same sort of input and perhaps the processing is is being done a little bit differently. Maybe we've got some some decreased sensitivity in the area. Maybe it's not locally. Maybe it's somewhere else. But the end result of whatever's happening is that we don't feel as much pain. And so then we might say, if we're assuming that the inputs are more or less the same, that our tolerance to those inputs has improved. So, you know, that would, would lend credence to the idea that our pain tolerance can be improved. We can use other examples like the first time that you learn how to hold the front rack and you have to jam the bar into your neck um, and it digs into your collarbones. That probably hurts like a son of a bitch too. Um, and then it's probably the case where you, you know, let's assume that you don't change anything about the mechanics. You probably are able to tolerate that better and better. Um, we could find similar examples in martial arts, you know, uh, fighters hitting with their shins probably hurts the first however long and then they get better and better so so i think you guys tell me if you agree of course that that pain tolerance tolerance to specific inputs can increase and it's also not necessarily dependent on um oh, how to say it we could uh, in these examples we've i've assumed that the inputs don't change um we we can probably still tolerate the experience of pain, even if the the inputs do change, and this is this is probably a uh, a function of the fact that that pain is again not directly tied to nociception of these unpleasant stimuli. They're they're a component, but they're not necessary nor sufficient. Um, so I gather my thoughts. You guys chime in. Go ahead, Quinn. Well, uh, so I'm reading the question, and mm -hmm. the question is posed in a way that it seems like. So is pain tolerance something that can be developed? The way that I read that question is assuming the pain is just going to stay the same. Will I now be better adapted to it? Will I be able to cope with it better? Or are we taking it for more from what I'm gathering from you, Jared, as we talk about desensitizing? You don't actually experience the, you don't have the experience of pain anymore. In that, mm -hmm. in that realm, because pain is a threat response, right? It's a threat appraisal sub system and it can go haywire. But mm -hmm. if, if I roll a, a metal 
pipe on my shins to try to toughen them up. That first, <laughs> that I wasn't going to go body. I wasn't even going to talk about body tempering. I, I was going to say, <laughs> right I'm, I'm going to talk martial arts. I was going to use Jared's thing. Yeah. If I, cause it's the first time that it, I'm also probably scared. It's the first time that I'm doing it. So not only is it a new novel, very strong sensory stimulus to my tissues that have never felt this before. So there's kind of, mm-hmm. They're sending inputs to my brain. It's also a new experience for my consciousness that's kind of threatening and a little scary. And so my brain perceives that as a threat because of all of those factors, the nociceptive input and also the my experiences and beliefs. But as I do it more and I, I know that, oh, my legs aren't going to snap in two. So now my beliefs and expectations are different. The nociception is still coming in and I don't think we know, I don't, or the sensory, sensory information is still coming in and I don't think we have a strong grasp on what's actually happening when things desensitize. Like, it's not like my nerve endings are dead when I roll that metal log over my shins for the thousandth time, but I don't feel it anymore. Or maybe they are, you know, maybe, maybe we have just blasted those nerve endings where they don't actually work as well. Uh, something like that. But it's like you said, Jared, it's a combination. But the way the question is posed, I don't necessarily think sometimes I do have conversations with people who in my office who have had pain for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And realistically, there's no magic that's going to happen in the next 60 days or 90 days. And we're not, and they're coming in with goals of being pain free, you know, after 10 years, after a decade of pain that hasn't really changed. So now our conversation is how do you better understand your experience and, and how do you better cope with, with your experience? And maybe in that respect, we're talking about somebody who's still going to experience the sensation but their tolerance to the sensation is changed because they no longer are afraid of it. Sure. Um, and even sometimes in that realm, they, they, that changes their experience. Oh, you mean it doesn't mean that I'm going to snap in two? And all of a sudden they are experiencing less of it because they're not scared of death. Um, <laughs> I want to go into load pain tolerance in the sense of building load tolerance and how, and some, some techniques that I use some simple stuff that I'm sure you guys do too, but I'm going to let John chime in before, before you do John, can I just say this again? Um, to your point, Quinn, I think we're also assuming that pain tolerance means that, uh, um, the, the amount of perceived pain goes down and via whatever mechanisms, um, if we wanted to, you know, maybe we could consider pain tolerance being just a recontextualization of it. Maybe we can tolerate the same amount of pain, but like you said, we now know that it's not as threatening as we may have once thought. And maybe we can still do these things that are meaningful to us. And maybe the the pain is still the same, but you know, we don't care about it as much, or we're doing these other things that we that we do care about. We're not paying as much attention to it. You know, I think that could, depending on how we're looking at it, also pass as pain tolerance. Now to you, John, if you want. Uh, I, I don't like the term pain tolerance. I don't like the word tolerance because for some reason it triggers a piece of my brain that makes someone think that tissue is stagnant, right? Uh, I need to build my pain tolerance in my knee because I have a bad knee. So I need to keep doing this because this is never actually going to get better kind of scenario. Um So that's why I struggle with the actual word tolerance, um, because we know the body is an incredibly robust and adaptable thing. And then, Quinn, you can jump right into the load stuff after this. But we start talking about the experience and we start talking about what we consider pain tolerance. And it's really about how do we how do we modify that experience and get them to do things that are obviously pain free and understand that. The healing process takes place. The healing process takes time. And by continuing to expose yourself to what would be considered uh, aggravating factors or uh, noxious stimuli, like Jared said, um, then we can increase your tolerance because you're actually going into that experience and building confidence within it and, and then also creating load so that 
you get adaptation. Um, the, the scenario we see it a lot is people with 10 year long pain. Um, we know after 10 years, you know, tissue heals over time and we can start to, to see some positive changes, um, but they still have that experience that's, that's built up. So tolerance is a tough word and it's what makes this question very, very tricky and sticky, um, especially with the language. So Quinn, you want to talk about load a little bit when it comes to this sort of thing? I totally agree with you with the word tolerance. I actually don't like it either talking about load tolerance. I say it all the time, but I, I don't actually like it because of exactly what you just said. It, it, it makes assumes, it seem mechanical. Yeah, well, it, it, it assumes a stopping point. Like, I'm, I don't want to just become tolerant to something. I want to f- fucking supersede that, and I want to adapt <laughs> to it. I think it reminds me of the book Anti-Fragile, where he makes the distinction by in the scene to live, he makes the distinction between anti-fragility and resiliency. And he defines resiliency as synonymous to what we're talking about with tolerance is the fact that you don't get hurt from a stressor. So you're tolerant to the stressor, but you don't adapt. You don't gain from the stressor and the notion of anti fragile or being being anti-fragile is that not only are you resilient to the stressor you actually adapt and are now better because of the stressor and we actually need stress to adapt so that's like that kind of distinction so maybe i'll just start saying how to increase your load anti-fragility but then people will probably hear me and think anti-fertility because i because it kind of sounds the same stay in your lane but anyway yeah oh yeah for sure um so one way, so pain tolerance or how can we increase your ability to handle more stress? How about that? I don't necessarily, I think that we could have it both ways. I think that your experience of discomfort and threat can go down while you can also increase capacity. But maybe that's the word. You increase capacity while your experience of threat goes down at the same time. Like that's certainly possible. And, you know, that's where it helps to quantify things like some, you know, a stupid but easy example is like, let's say you're doing uh, an isometric leg extension and you're using an ideal world. You have some way to quantify it, like a tensiometer or something like that. And so you could have somebody with patellar tendinopathy <clears throat> that is that is reactive. It's it's, it's symptomatic with all the the traditional activities, running, jumping, landing, cutting, squatting, going, you know, eccentric loading, these types of things. So you do an isometric leg extension at 60 degrees and you quantify it. And I say, I want you to push gradually, take, take five or six seconds to, to work up into a maximum push or maximum hold. But I'll say first, I want you to tell me as you're gradually working up and load, as soon as you begin to feel your symptoms, I want you to tell me. And I call that kind of, maybe that's low tolerance number one. So what is the amount of force that you can put in where you just start to feel your symptoms? And actually in the research, they call that pain-free force production, but it's actually not because it's when they first experience their pain. But it's like right in the beginning. I want you to tell me when it's a point, it's no longer a zero out of 10, it's a point one, but you experience something that's not on the other side or something that would be perceived as pain. I write that number down. Symptom threshold. Yeah, symptom threshold. I write that number down. Then it's like, okay, now I want you to put as much juice as you got as you're comfortable putting in. They say, well, it's going to hurt. It's as you're comfortable putting in. So if you can just max it out and it's only still only an amount of discomfort that you're cool with, cool. But if an amount of discomfort is to the point where you no longer want to put more force into it, that's that's the point. That's where we want to be too. So I have two different numbers. That symptom threshold and also their ability to just what is the most force that you can put in and then i record the symptoms so we can test that and you say like over time we expect your symptom threshold to go up so you'll be able to put more load without feeling your symptom until you feel your symptoms and we'll gauge the old number of your maximum force production in let's say four to six weeks i'll will retest and that number that you hit and it was a six out of 10 pain. Well, now that number is like a two. 
Um, and they're, you know, same force production, but now it's a much lower threat appraisal. Um, and then sometimes people's minds will play tricks on them because we'll do the same test. and They'll say, okay, now give it all you got. And they'll say, well, it still was like a six out of 10 pain. But then I'll say, well, look at the number though. You doubled your force production. Go back to the old number. It was now, the old number is now only a two. So I think you've got to kind of spin it that way. Yeah. It's like, you're going to feel for, for pain to be completely gone or for you not to experience that is, I, I don't give timelines on that. I say there, you know, is that an expectation? Is that possible that you just hit this inflection point and all of a sudden you just never feel your symptoms again? Yeah. Anything's possible. But what's more realistic, and we're talking with more chronic scenarios here, um, like something like a tendinopathy or something like that. The more, what's more realistic is that you're going to be able to do more before you have your, uh, a flare up. Um, your flare ups are going to be less severe and they're not going to last as long. Um, and you're, and so like that in, in a sense is creating tolerance. Uh, for lack of a better word, or increasing your capacity in that realm. And you could, you don't, you know, have to have a dynamometer. You could do tempo back squats at a certain load, you know, and I did a set of 10, a tempo back squat with a hundred pounds. And it was a, f this rating of discomfort. And six months later or six weeks later, I do a hundred pounds and it's this, or I can do now I can do 150 pounds at the same level of discomfort that I could only do a hundred at last time. Um, so you can, you can quantify these things that way. The drawback is you got to be careful with people who already perseverate on their pain. And that's kind of the, that's one of the drawbacks of using like a visual analog scale or a numerical pain rating scale where they're constantly thinking about rating their discomfort all day. It's like, Oh, it's today. I'm a 7.2 or is it, well, it's more like a 6.8. Uh, and so, and so that's like, now they're just, you're just continuing to condition themselves or condition mm -hmm. them to their, to their symptoms too. So you got to be careful about that. Um, and I don't have a great, great solution other than the fact that I try to tell them like, we're going to quantify things in here so that we can create baseline um, outcomes, you know, track progress over time. But for you, I just want you to kind of use your sensations and your feelings more as a guide, just giving you information. I don't want you to, I don't want you to, you know, be too over analytical about it, but what are you guys' thoughts on that? Well, just, just the last part to kind of add to that. The other thing to communicate is because pain is complex, that it's not always an abnormal thing. This is a normal response to certain conditions and that quantifying it repeatedly is it, it's it's not really going to help us go in the direction that we need to go to understand and frame pain in the way that we want it framed so that we can use it because what we're kind of talking about is using those reports as a tool to actually get better mm -hmm. um and then the the tolerance stuff is is still kind of twisting my brain up a little bit but jerry <laughs> go ahead yeah um in uh in my practice in the clinic, I've, as of the last, I don't know if it's been a year, but the last several months I've thrown out pretty well my, the entire use of, of any like numeric pain rating system. And I, I used to use it for, for a while and with things like tendinopathy and, and not just tendinopathy, but especially tendinopathy cases, I would say, uh, if you can call this, you know, four or five out of 10 or less, we're good to go and, and all of that. But then the thing that, that I can't get around and the reason why I threw it out is because that that's going to be defined differently. And I, I just don't think it's as useful um, as I once did. And, and a big part of that Quinn is the reason or is, is uh, what you talked about or where we get focused on the numbers. And if we constantly ask them about their pain, that's probably reinforcing the focus on it. So now, uh, you know, I'll do stuff with people and they'll say, Oh, that kind of hurt. I'm like, Oh, it okay was it manageable and if they say yes then we keep going and if they say it's no then okay we change something about it and i keep asking the same question can you handle it and i think that repeated question hopefully has a better um effect consciously and subconsciously because if they start asking themselves that question like can i handle this that's probably putting this in a, in a it's reframing it in a better context <clears throat> and you know um i think i think it was you john who 
or no, maybe it was you, Quinn, um, talked about the inflection point. Could you, could you be pain free? Sure. Potentially. Um, do we need to be pain free? Sure. It'd be nice, but do we have to be, can we do the things that we want to do and, and still have some pain? Cause if we can do the things we want to do and the pain is manageable, that's probably the more valuable and realistic thing. And that's a hard sell. I mean, the, the inherent drive or desire to, to be pain free. I think that's, that's natural and normal. Pain is unpleasant for a reason. That's the entire, it's the crux of it. Um, but you know, I, I see it on the intake forms all the time. Like what's your, upon finishing physiotherapy, what's your, your main goal? Pain free. And, and sometimes we have this conversation where like, I don't say, Hey, that's probably a bad goal. But I say, oh, okay, so I know you said that. That's a that's a great goal. You know, are there are there other things that kind of go into that? Would you, you know, are there other ways that you can measure your successes? And then I just don't talk about being paid free again. Talk about <laughs> managing stuff. Yeah, I actually really like that question. The can can you manage it? Because that, at least in my brain, fundamentally shifts locus of control onto them. This can can you do this instead mm-hmm. of us putting kind of an arbitrary number to where we're going to stop that threshold. It allows them a little bit of that control and then they can start to explore some of those things. So that I, I really like that way to frame it a lot, a lot actually. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, the great thing about lifting weights is that you can use that as your quantification. It's like, I still struggle getting away from, from paying rating scales altogether only because of, of that, like, ah, oh, it's a way, mm-hmm. it's just an easy way to quantify your progress. But at the same time, you know, I always give two guidelines or usually give two guidelines there because people will ask, well, what's an amount of pain that's okay? <clears throat> and yeah. it's like, well, I, I can't say a four out of 10 yeah, because that means, you know, very little. But what I usually say is I have two general guidelines. One is the amount of discomfort shouldn't make you apprehensive to the movement. Like, let's take a back squat, for example. It's just like if you're walking up to the bar and you're like, God, this set's really going to suck. This is really going to hurt. You know, it's, it's probably a little bit too much. You yeah. know, we're just, yeah. we're just conditioning that response. And then mm-hmm. the other guideline is whether or not you're apprehensive to it or not, is the discomfort, are you moving differently to get away from the discomfort? Are you stress shielding the area, whether mm-hmm. you're doing that consciously or subconsciously? Um, so if you're apprehensive and or not able to move through the discomfort willingly and freely, then I'll say whatever that is to you, mm-hmm. that's to, that is our, that's our ceiling. I don't, we don't want to go there or past that. Um, mm-hmm. and people will sometimes put numbers to it themselves. I say, Oh, that's like, it's usually like a five is where I get apprehensive. I say, okay, five is your, that's your threshold then no more than that. Mm-hmm. But those, yeah. those guidelines are more of like setting the tone and then we can quantify things by the load. So yeah. you could just ask them, oh, it used to be a hundred pounds that made me apprehensive. And now I just squatted 115 and I wasn't apprehensive at all. But at 135, oh shit, I was scared. Okay. I'll say, well, there's, your, there's your ceiling. Yeah. But it, you know, we were quantifying that that way and then leaving the pain experience subjective. Yeah. Because that's do, what it do is. You, do you think that, uh, to use your example or the, the first guideline about, you know, not, um, how did you phrase it? Uh, like walking up to the squat set, what was, what was the actual guideline that you said? Uh, it, the, the amount of discomfort shouldn't create apprehension or anxiety to performing the movement. Right. Okay. Do you think that you could change, um, change that guideline by, changing the the expectancy like I, I think you guys correct me if i'm wrong i think in the literature on tendons we find that there's there's often the sort of warming up effect where if you if you keep things the same and you just do it a few more times usually or, or quite often things feel better um so if, if if someone were to walk up to that squat set do the first one and it felt like shit and then they walk away and they tell themselves that did feel like shit but i know that there's a chance that this might feel better on set two and set three like, does that, does that meet your requirement for that first guideline? Yeah. Um, I have several. Yeah. It's, it's very great. It's a good question. I, my, I, I'm usually also recommending that they, they take very small jumps and they mm-hmm. take lots of sets. And usually like the warm up period kind of happens naturally as they're working up. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my, th- 
yeah. So my, my guideline is more of they are like, there's a fear avoidance and it's mm-hmm. not just, I'm going to feel my symptoms. Cause right. I've got a guy right now who with bilateral quad tendinopathy who always, right? Well, it's a bit always. I say like the first month he always reports like, yeah, first set <laughs> stiff, second and third set loosened up. Great. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more of, I, I did this because I just, the, it said it on the paper, 83%. Yeah. And I just, I had to do it. Um, I knew right. it was going to hurt. And now, you know, 24 hours later, mm-hmm. we're still, we're still flared up. Right. So there's, yeah, there's a gray. That's a good question. <clears throat> and, and, you know, to your point about, um, having things that are convenient ways to quantify stuff, like I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I, I don't use the MPRS for my patients. I, I, Pref, much prefer not to, but for my coach, you know, um, cause I'm dealing with, with some longer term hamstring, proximal hamstring symptoms. Um, you know, I'll mention like, you know, squats felt started off as like a two out of 10. Then they warmed up to like a one or the set was a, was a one. Then I hit a four or five. And, and that's, I use that as a way to quantify it. So my coach knows roughly where I'm at. Um, and I think, Going back to, to another thing that you said, Quinn, about uh, people who are already perseverating on on their pain, I, I think, um, not to, to put myself on any sort of pedestal, but I think that I'm at a place right now where I can be okay with the fact that I've got some pain and it's not, uh, if I say that I had a, you know, a four out of 10 pain experience on this particular set, I don't think that would affect me much differently than if I were to say like I had moderate moderately intense pain on that. Like, I think that's the, means the same thing to me. So it's, it's just another way to communicate to someone else. And it's, I don't think it has, um, uh, significant negative consequences after the fact, because I'm using the numbers, but I still do not like using that with my clinical population. But you're, just crossing, you're just crossing a language barrier at that point. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know what I mean? That's something, especially from a coaching perspective, it's just, much simpler and much easier. Yep. And you probably of, of all people have a pretty good reference as to what your four is compared to mm-hmm. something else. Yeah. Dara, so. do, do you think that you're more comfortable with yourself using the pain rating scale or maybe other athletes that are less emotional about their pain experience? Like, yes. Where, okay. So where you are now, you kind of detach, like, if you feel discomfort, it's more of information for you. You're mm-hmm. not connecting it with emotion. And maybe you did that in the past. So now you're like, oh yeah, the pain is this. It's a two. Well, and I did my workout and now it's this. It's just inform. It's almost like an RPE scale at that point. Yep. It's a subjective. It's, I mean, that's RPE is a subjective rating. It's a rating of subjectivity. It's our exertion level, which yep. is unreliable yep. if we're comparing our seven RPE to somebody else's seven, but it, The difference, it's like, what's the difference between that and a pain rating scale? I think the big difference is the Mm -hmm. fact that with pain, it's a very negative experience for most people. Sure. Um, and we have that emotional response. I think it's, if it's not negative, then it's not technically pain. You'll have to, I don't know. You'll you'll have to get me on that one. (laughs) Um, and so I, I feel the same way as you, Jared, now for myself and, I have a, I have patients who I'm more comfortable quantifying those things with because they are very mm-hmm. detached from the experience. And we've been working long enough now where we can have those conversations, but there are others who yeah. are extremely fear avoidant that I don't go there with. And then also mm-hmm. with the, the apprehension and anxiety thing, I think bodes well when I'm consulting remotely for somebody, when somebody's going on the, off on their own. And we're just trying to like stay under threshold a little bit to, you know, reduce risk of flare up. It's like, that's kind of where those guidelines are coming from. Just for sure. Yeah. um, I'd agree with that. Sorry. We start getting into coping mechanisms and and different personality types with, with COVID coping profiles. And it starts to get really deep into some psych. So for sure. And yeah, no, I'd agree with what you said, Quinn. And, and I'll be real too. Like I, I still get, more emotional than I, than I want to sometimes just because I'm, I am a human, um, like I'm assuming the rest of our listeners are as well. Um, but I do try to keep it very informational, try to be fairly stoic about it as it were. Um, and I think I'd be emotional about it even if I didn't use that 
or sorry, I think I'd still be as emotional about stuff, uh, probably with the same frequency, even if I didn't use those those numbers. And I definitely agree that it is crossing language barrier. It's another way for us to um, communicate, and ideally with those athletes who aren't going to fixate on those numbers in a, in a unhelpful way. Hopefully, that made sense. Yeah, we went deep on that one. We did. We did. We went off off the into the deep end. That's for sure. You know, I do want to bring. Yeah, I went. I uh, that same guy who bilateral patellar tendon or quad tendon pain. I took him to failure on the K box squat on the oh. um you know flywheel squats and he. What did he do to you? <laughs> who hurt you? Quinn? No, he fixed himself. He he totally fixed himself because afterwards he could barely. So, well, he almost, bro- he, after he unhooked himself, he almost broke his face because his quads didn't work anymore. But he was like, dude, my knees don't hurt. <laughs> I was like, yes. Is it, is it that descending noxious inhibition? That's that, gotta uh, be. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that exercise induced analgesia, AKA yeah. pain overrides pain. Yeah. yeah. Break your finger when you get a gunshot wound. That's right. Insane. Homeopathy at this point, like heals like, right? So I was asking, oh. you know, it's like, if you got punched in the face right now, do you think your ankle would hurt anymore? Probably not. Yeah. Who knows? All right, bring us home quick. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay. A couple things. Uh, Jared, speaking of pain, very soon, yes. Jared will be launching a pain science continuing education course. It's going to be online and it's going to be it's well it is awesome that's going to be very very soon um mm. so stay tuned for that we're going to be we're going to be announcing all about that um and it goes into what we talked about in a much more coherent way systematic way um and then we're also going to be launching a new seminar and john is going to be heading that as well and that is the clinical athlete powerlifting certification you know we got the clinical athlete weightlifting certification snatch and clean and jerk um you know the real athletes but now we're going to let the powerlifters come and play <laughs> i'm not i'm not going to dispute that <laughs> we're going to even so allow pretty. we're going to even allow low bar squatting Ooh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. i actually uh have a, a little section in there for equipped lifting too. Oh, hey, there you go. Yeah. Equipped lifters need love too. They do. They get smaller every single year, the number of them, but they're an important demographic. John, oh, yeah. what, what excites you most about the clinical athlete powerlifting certification? Oh, honestly, um, uh, nothing, right? Honestly, uh, <laughs> honestly, the thing that, that excites me the most about it is trying to get through some of the dogma for people and the the systematized way that we look at powerlifting. Um, I think there are a lot of things that you can take from multiple different styles and systems in powerlifting to constantly progress and feel better while doing it. Uh, instead of kind of getting stuck in your box with starting strong, uh, starting strength or, you know, if you're a conjugate guy or if you're everybody identifies as one particular thing. And I think, um, one thing that I really want to do with this is show the merits of all of those things to stay healthy and be successful. So that's what I'm the most excited about is to get rid of some of that dogma. Well, we talk about principles all the time and principles should be universal. So yeah. it, the principles of, of tissue adaptation and stress management and performance and rehab are, are kind of under the same umbrella that we're trying to reconcile these two worlds because they've been separated for so long. But, you know, really, it's just it's it's all kind of the same. We can manipulate these these variables and and implement these concepts and principles, you know, on both sides of the coin, whether it be performance or or rehab or whatever. Um, and that's what this course is going to be. And so, stay tuned for announcements in regards to um, setting up dates for 2019. I'm we're super excited about that. And John, where can people find more about you? Where can they connect with you and all that you do? Uh, Instagram is Rebuild Stronger Online. Uh, my Facebook, just search John Flag, and that's pretty much it. I stick to those two platforms. I'm not a Twitter guy or a Snapchat guy. So Snapchat, uh, it's for the young 16? kids. 
<laughs> um, Not here. Is that where people can, if they want coaching or or, or w- want to work with you, they can hit you up in the, on those platforms as well? Yeah, Instagram is typically the best one for me um, through for coaching inquiries for uh, any any type of contact, any questions that you have for me. You can hit me up on Instagram. Um, that's the one I'm probably the most active on. So beard oil recommendations, right? Yeah, yeah. It's only for Eric Lagoy, though. Ah. Only for Eric. Yeah, I got I got nothing. Um, so look what happens when we talk about pain. Hour and a, <laughs> hour and a half later. Yeah. Okay. Well, say it's only seven thirty for me, and you both you guys are on the on the East Coast. 30. Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, John, dude, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Absolutely, that I appreciate awesome. it anytime. Absolutely, anytime. Jared. Thank you as always. My pleasure, man. Thank you. All right. We'll catch you guys next time.